Thanks very much, Eve. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming and holding out for the for the one of the last talks of the day. Um, so uh, I moved to Orlando a couple years ago. I was at the University of Pittsburgh um, for 18 years, where I worked with uh, many good people. I'm going to show you some of the data that. Uh, we collected over the years in the Health, Aging, and Body Composition Study. Hopefully some of you got to see the, uh, the symposium earlier on muscle quality where Eva Milokovic gave a really nice overview of myosteatosis and um, some of the ter terminology surrounding muscle fat infiltration. Um, and before I start, I want to just acknowledge that uh, a lot of the work that I've done over the years has been in, in collaboration with Dr. Ann Newman in Pittsburgh, who's here, and um, it's been a really fruitful collaboration, and I'm happy to say that we continue to work together even though I moved to Florida. So, so with that, I thought I would set the stage a little bit today um, and talk about what I think are some emerging paradigms in sarcopenia. Perhaps they're not emerging so much anymore. When I first started talking about muscle fat infiltration and sarcopenia and aging more than a decade ago, it was a fairly new concept. And as you know, it's not so new anymore. But what I think needs at least some clarification is, is again, some of the concepts around muscle fat infiltration from um, the, uh, the visible adipose tissue infiltration that you see on a on a CT scan or MRI scan like you see over there on the left where the adipose tissue is artificially colorized by uh, purple there um, to looking at fat infiltration in muscle cells. So what you see in the middle there is from one of, one of our percutaneous skeletal muscle biopsies highlighting oil red -o, uh, staining of neutral lipid droplets in muscle cells. So there are these uh, lipid uh, droplets or lipids, mostly triglycerides, in myocytes. And again, these are from human samples. Um, and then what you see on the right is a scanning electron micrograph of one single muscle cell taken from a biopsy um, stained with osmium, uh, clearly showing lipid droplets in a single muscle cell. So where we got some of our ideas actually with muscle fat infiltration um, comes from this guy. So this is a Japanese beef uh, cow, Wagyu beef. If you've ever, um, if you know anything about Wagyu beef, you know that one of the reasons people love Wagyu beef is because of its fat infiltration. And, and you look, when you look at the agricultural literature, you see that the degree of fat infiltration by the marbling score um, is really an index of the beef quality, um, opposite of what we think in terms of you know, what quality may be good or bad. But in the, in the beef cattle, more fat infiltration is good because the beef is tender. And actually, there's a literature on this. When you look at some of the data from the agricultural um, literature, it turns out that fattier muscle, uh, muscle that has fat around it, uh, is actually weaker. So what they've done in these studies, they tease apart the muscle from these cows, and the fattier the muscle, the weaker it is. So we get some of our ideas from this and some neurological uh, disease literature that at that, you know, in, until the mid-90s or so were, were qualified, you know, that was semi-quantitative. They would um, qualify muscle fat infiltration, they would describe it, but really never quantify it. And it, so it wasn't really until the late 90s that we started to quantify fat infiltration in the setting of obesity, insulin resistance, and type 2 diabetes, um, where we could qu quantify you know, not only subcutaneous adipose tissue, but also this subfascial and intramuscular adipose tissue. And one of the early observations that we made was that when we brought um, human volunteers into the clinical research unit, and did hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamps for measuring insulin sensitivity, insulin resistance, we could see that the subcutaneous adipose tissue on the left, 
was not associated with insulin resistance, um, but both the subfascial and the intermuscular fat was um, at least moderately correlated with insulin resistance. So this was our first clue that this was a, a unique adipose tissue depot that perhaps had unique uh, metabolic qualities, at least that was associated with insulin resistance. So at the same time, uh, working with uh, Ann Newman, Steve Krzyzewski, uh, Tammy Harris, and others from the Health ABC study, um, and this, again, this was in the late 90s when Health ABC started. These are actually baseline data from Health ABC. So these are men and women in their, in their 70s that you can see on the bottom that we quantified um, uh, muscle cross-sectional area on CT and confirmed, as others had done in cross-sectional studies, that for both men and women, there was a, an age-related decrease in muscle mass, in this case, muscle cross-sectional area. And you can tell this is an old slide because my Mac to PC uh, conversion was a little bit uh, messed up there on the left. But you get the point that uh, for both men in the red and women in the blue, there's a progressive decline. Again, this is cross-sectional data. Um, in muscle cross-sectional area, um, sort of defining the classic sarcopenia, right? So in this same study, we also uh, quantified the muscle attenuation. So if you look at the, um, the graph, the scale on the bottom is muscle attenuation in Hounsfield units, and you probably have seen this before, that the Hounsfield unit on CT uh, corresponds to a density value in muscle, and that's why CT is so good at separating fat muscle and bone because of its attenuation or density characteristics. And so what you see in this graph, and this, these are data from the same subjects, that um, men and women with low Hounsfield units, low muscle density, uh, corresponds to uh, low muscle quality. So what you can't see, uh, because of the, the uh, little mishap with the graph there, is that um, on the, on the uh, y-axis, there's a, um, a muscle quality. So strength per unit muscle area on CT uh, corresponds to uh, or correlates with muscle density. And I'm not showing you the data today, but we had done some, stu some validation studies in Pittsburgh um, where I went down to the radiology department late at night with chemical lipid phantoms and we also did muscle biopsies to correlate attenuation values to muscle triglyceride content and biopsies and showed that this low muscle attenuation value was quite strongly related to the muscle lipid content. So on our hands, this attenuation value was a pretty good surrogate for fatty infiltration in the muscle um, tissue itself. So excluding um, the visible adipose tissue, so this is muscle tissue, more the intramuscular fat, not the intermuscular adipose tissue. So we're looking now at both intermuscular adipose tissue as well as intramuscular fat. So the other observation that we made in Health ABC was in longitudinal analyses showing here that the, uh, the loss of muscle strength was about three times greater than we see uh, for the loss of muscle mass per se. And I think if, there's, if, if there are a few things that this study has done for the field, one has been to really, first of all, highlight this potential importance of muscle fat infiltration, but also perhaps in association with that um, to highlight that Sarcopenia, per se, as it was traditionally fine by low muscle mass, was really not correlated very strongly in these older people with strength. And this longitudinal data, I think, highlights this very well, that for both men and women, again, the strength declines were far greater than the mass declines. Very similarly, and this is, um, uh, longitudinal data now shown with CT. Previously, this was shown with strength per unit um, leg lean mass on DEXA for three years. Now we're looking at five-year change data in the same cohort, um, showing in the green that these men and women are certain, certainly losing muscle as they get older over five years. Um, 
But as you can see, the peak torque and the specific torque, torque per unit muscle area, is much more dramatic than the loss of muscle mass per se. So again, corresponding or confirming what we saw earlier that there's a far greater decline in strength than the loss of mass. So in these same CT scans, um, well, so first of all, just to kind of put an exclamation point, I guess, on this data, we, you know, when, when we have a cohort as large as Health ABC with um, at, at five years uh, change, we had about 2,500 subjects remaining in the data set um, in, the, in the cohort that even when you partitioned out subjects or did sub-analyses on men and women who were um, gaining weight over time and even gaining muscle, as you can see in the green bar, so these men and women either were maintaining muscle mass or even significantly gaining muscle mass, um, they still had a decrease in muscle strength and muscle quality. So again, I think highlighting a real disconnect between strength and mass. And so in these CT scans, as you can see on the bottom right, um, not only were we quantifying muscle size, a cross-sectional area, but we were also uh, had, had quantified um, intermuscular adipose tissue and subcutaneous adipose tissue. So what you see in the, in, the, in the bars there are an annualized percent decline in muscle size and the change in muscle fat, and they clearly decrease muscle size, as you've seen. Right now, uh, what you see here is, is different, again, that it's just annualized percent decline. Um, but what was really striking to us is that um, there's a complete opposite uh, uh, response between subcutaneous fat in the leg and the intermuscular fat in the leg. And then, again, this is adipose tissue. So these men and women over time are losing subcutaneous adipose tissue, which by the way is probably another talk on another day about the potential protective effect of subcutaneous adipose tissue, but the increase in this intermuscular adipose tissue. And just to say, uh, in this cohort, uh, the increase in intermuscular adipose tissue is a far stronger signature of aging than the loss of muscle mass. And so um, one of the other observations that we made coinciding with this was that there was an accelerated loss of muscle mass and muscle strength in these older people with diabetes. Um, we had known from our earlier work that middle-aged people with diabetes have greater fat infiltration, and now we're seeing in these older people with this study back in 2007, almost a decade ago now, that their uh, loss of mass and strength corresponds um, to their uh, greater fatty infiltration. Again, it's all association data and correlative, um, but nonetheless, I think it's, it's fitting with the overall concept that muscle fat infiltration uh, may be a bad thing. Um, and then just to uh, highlight a few studies along the way that have shown that uh, cross-sectional myosteatosis, poor strength that we had shown before, uh, that I showed you the data for. Um, Health ABC had also shown that there's a, that an association between uh, muscle fat infiltration by the muscle attenuation and hip fracture uh, associated with uh, worse physical function. Marilyn Visser uh, wrote some really nice papers on that. And, and ultimately also, uh, this is unpublished data um, showing that muscle fat infiltration is also so associated with higher mortality um, in these uh, older men and women. And so what is, on a histological level, this muscle fat infiltration. Well, we had the fortunate opportunity a few years ago to collaborate with Marlo Zamboni and colleagues, um, along with Tammy Harris um, from the NIA, um, to do a study in, um, in which we were able to excise some muscle tissue from patients undergoing elective uh, surgery for spinal stenosis. So these are muscle samples taken from these patients. What you see in red or in pink are muscle fibers and if we would take a sample from one of us in the room, it would be pure muscle. 
But what we see in these spinal stenosis patients is that there's a lot of fat infiltration in the muscle, and you can see that these are truly adipocytes. So when you zoom in on some of these muscle samples, you can see these islands of adipocytes embedded in the muscle. And this raises some interesting questions about how does the muscle, you know, how do the adipocytes get there? Um, is this because some uh, pre uh, reprogramming of the progenitor cells that should be muscle and now they're uh, being programmed to adipocytes? We think there's some evidence for that because these are, again, truly adipocytes. Um, but again, I think it raises some interesting questions about not only the correlations between uh, intermuscular adipose tissue uh, you know, with, with aging and sarcopenia and, and loss of function, but um, potentially how to prevent it. You know, what are, what are the, what's the etiology of how we get these adipocytes in the muscle? And so in this study um, uh, led by Zoico uh, from Mauro Zamboni's group, it was interesting that we looked at some specific uh, markers of gene expression in these muscle samples from these spinal stenosis patients. And to make a long story short, I'm not gonna take you through this complicated slide, but if you look at some of the uh, markers, some of the inflammatory genes in the muscle, as well as some of the atrogenes, like the atrogen uh, and, and the MRF1, and some genes that are associated with uh, muscle regeneration, like MyoD, um, all these genes are different um, in these patients with a higher degree of fatty infiltration and fibrosis. So again, it's correlative, but nonetheless showing that there's an association between the degree of fatty infiltration and then what might be happening on a molecular level in the muscle tissue. And then so um, I want to shift gears a little bit and uh, show you uh, some data from an intervention study that we did a few years ago as part of the LIFE pilot study. I know many of you have heard of the LIFE trial. Well, before the LIFE trial, the big life trial. Uh, we did a life pilot study. Pittsburgh was, was a site in the life pilot study. Um, and this was, as, as a lot of you know, in collaboration with Marco Cujor and colleagues. And what we did in this pilot study was, with CT scans, quantify the effects of a physical activity, a one-year physical activity intervention on um, muscle mass, muscle quality, and fat infiltration. And this was a very small study. This was only 22 subjects in each of these groups, but nonetheless, it was a randomized controlled trial in this pilot study. And what we saw in the control subjects who received a health education control, you know, a control intervention, that um, there was a, a one-year decrease in muscle size, reflecting really a typical one-year uh, change in muscle, uh, a loss of muscle. With physical activity, um, there was a trend, it wasn't significant, a trend that the physical activity, the mo modest physical activity program um, attenuated this decrease in muscle size. But what was more dramatic was that the physical activity program significantly attenuated the loss of muscle strength and muscle quality. Now, what about uh, fat infiltration? Well, when we look at the control group, we see uh, a one-year increase of about 15 to 20 percent of intramuscular adipose tissue in the control group. And this was completely prevented by moderate physical activity. Now, it's interesting to think that if we would have only done a one-arm, you know, just pre-post measurement of intramuscular adipose tissue in the physical activity group, we would have, we would have interpreted this as the physical activity had no effect on intramuscular adipose tissue. But when you compare it to the group that increased by 15%, the interpretation clearly is that there's a prevention of this increase in intramuscular adipose tissue. And you might be thinking, well, this is just increasing the fat accumulation with physical activity until you look at the subcutaneous adipose tissue change in which there's no effect whatsoever from the physical activity. So there's clearly something unique that physical activity does to this intermuscular adipose tissue depot, and it's in conjunction with the, the prevention of the, uh, decre or the attenuated uh, increase in muscle quality. In other words, there's an association between this intermuscular adipose tissue and muscle quality. And then, so in the last couple slides, just to shift gears uh, yet again, 
I think partly where the field needs to go now and has, has done really some of this in the past decade, and that is to start to look at the muscle quality from a cellular perspective. So in this study led um, at, from, uh, by the Wake Forest group, Osvaldo Del Bono and colleagues and Barb Nicholas and, and their group, uh, showing that when, um, when you look at uh, uh, human muscle and the relationship with, between intramyocellular lipid content and single fiber contractility function, um, you can see that there are quite strong associations between the lipid content in the myocyte and the ability of that myocyte to contract. And this is really one of the few studies that have looked at this association between contractility and muscle lipid content on a cellular level. And I think we need to do more studies like this to better understand some of the mechanisms by which this association may occur. And the last um, 30 seconds or so, I'll just say that one of the things that our group has been interested in in the past 10 to 15 years is looking at some of these other lipids in muscle, such as ceramides, sphingolipids, and diacylglycerol, as, as they might associate with contractility and metabolic dysfunction that may not relate at all to just the neutral triglyceride content. And a lot of this work has been led in my group by Paul Cohen, um, who moved from Pittsburgh to Florida with me, and he's been particularly interested in the role of sphingolipids and ceramides in not only insulin resistance, but also muscle contractility. And these are unpublished data from, our, from one of our human studies uh, showing that, and you can read, you can read the, because I can't read uh, the, uh, the slide from here, but basically, well, I can see it here, that the, uh, the ceramides and sphingolipids in these muscle biopsies from these human subjects is related to many in vivo uh, muscle characteristics like muscle power, uh, muscle uh, strength, as well as the, um, the uh, atrogen uh, gene expression, as you can see on the top right there, um, and some of the other parameters that might be more associated with mechanisms of not only age-related loss of muscle, but disuse atrophy. And this is really just to kind of, again, highlight the point that where we and I think others are going in the field now is to, to begin looking at what characteristics in the muscle cell um, that might be related to muscle lipid content, fat infiltration, that on a mechanistic la level are more uh, correlated or implicated in the loss of muscle mass, muscle function, um, and overall function. So with that, um, just to acknowledge my collaborators along the way, and I'd be happy to take some questions. Thank you.